but there is much more to say, and you should look uh, these experts up after you decided you really like their work. So we'll see. So Lizzie Shepard is an assistant professor in psychology at the University of Nottingham. Uh, she did a PhD and postdoc at the University at Nottingham and then worked as a lecturer at the Nottingham's Malaysia campus before returning to the UK in 2015. Her research interests include autism, mind reading, driving and cross-cultural perspectives. Mind reading is a, is a term we will talk about. It is not, uh, it's not uh, what you might imagine. It's sort of uh, uh, this magic mind reading. It is a different thing, and we'll talk a lot about it. Uh, I told you before, both Lizzie and Brett are experts in autism research, which is a subject that's very close to my heart, so I'm very excited to speak with them today. I've read all of their work, so it's like meeting a, a celebrity today. So, no, we had celebrities all day. We have celebrities all day, from, from the beginning to the end. Uh, and now, Brett Heisman uh, is a senior lecturer in psychology at York St. John University. He's interested in understanding communication, interaction, and how to remove the barriers that face people who have hidden differences. So these are Lizzie and Brett from now on. And Bent, are they high? Are they spotlighted? So uh, she is right now spotlighted. So let's add. Let's add uh, Brett as well. So we'll see them both. So I could see their reactions. Okay, very good. Now we see both of you. So we're going to talk about empathy in the context of autism, and you know, there's a long and we might say, as you'll see soon, problematic history uh, that of different perspectives that address autism or contextualize autism in terms of empathy. And well, there's a huge problematic there that we'll get to, but I want to ask uh, maybe Lizzie or, or, or Brett, uh, whoever of you would like to begin, to maybe tell us a little bit about this progression that we see in the, in the history of autism research uh, in terms of the contextualization of empathy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go if, uh, if Lizzie, you're happy for me to, to kick yeah. things off. Uh, yeah, excellent. Well, well thanks, uh, Leon, first of all, for um, inviting me to talk. Uh, I'm really um, sad I can't be there in person, but it's, it's lovely to be able to, through technology, be connected in some way uh, and as I've understood your, your, your topic for your conference has been about critical approaches to empathy. Um, and so we thought when we were thinking about how to manage this session about uh, that the history, as you've mentioned, is really important. Uh, and it, it remains uh, an object uh, that continues to affect empathy as it happens today. So knowing the history um, is a key part of that. And autism uh, ha has a very complex relationship with uh, empathy. So I thought I, I could just give a sort of really brief overview, which I think will can help set the context for some of the things that uh, Lizzie can expand on uh, in more detail. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, for those of you that don't know, and apologies if I, if I repeat things that are, are very obvious or you already know, um, autism uh, was first used as a term, so I'm, I'm talking about the context in the UK. Um, in around 1911, we see the first use of uh, the term autism, uh, which was used to describe at the time um, a, a type of uh, schizophrenia. So um, the interest here was the idea that uh, children could be so lost in their own imaginative worlds that their inner life couldn't be accessed from the outside. Uh, and so this was uh, the, the first kind of usage of the word. Um, and incidentally, there's a really great uh, paper by Bonnie Evans uh, about the sort of history of child development uh, concepts in the UK, which uh, helps to inform this, this sort of background understanding. Uh, so, so 1911 is the first usage of the word, and, and we see throughout the, the 20s, 30s and 40s uh, by psychoanalysts and psychiatrists, uh, this understanding of autism um, as being linked to this type of schizophrenia. Uh, what we have then throughout the 20th century is a number of transformations, uh, semantic transfer transformations in the meaning of autism, and this had consequences for 
uh, how empathy is able to develop and be understood. So uh, in around about the uh, 60s, we see um, epidemiological studies uh, really uh, becoming interested in autism at a population level. So up until then, it's been understood very much on an uh, individual case basis. But uh, with the epidemiological approach or epidemiological turn, you see this re really big interest in trying to actually identify how uh, what is the propensity of autism in the population? And in order to do that, it had knock on effects in terms of uh, needing to create very standardized approaches to what is a very diverse um, uh, phenomenon to describe. So that was one challenge there. Another one is that uh, it being epidemiological, it brings with it a number of assumptions about, uh, particularly from the medical model, this idea that uh, that there's some kind of normal functioning, um, which uh, needs some kind of intervention or fixing to get it back on course. Uh, and so these are uh, assumptions that work very well in the sort of uh, uh, biomedical context. But when you're sort of at that intersection of of body and mind um, and identity, it can become slightly problematic using uh, just those approaches. So uh, we then see in the uh, 1980s a cognitive turn, um, this idea that um, autism is specifically related to a, a defective component within uh, the ability to imagine other people, other minds. Uh, and that in itself then spawned a huge amount of research that was exploring these ideas that I think Lizzie can expand on in terms of theory of mind, um, and particularly a, a kind of methodological fascination with how we create very, very neat psychological experiments to try and provide us some kind of binary distinction as to what autistic people can and can't do and uh, uh, where specifically the deficit might lie in uh, social ability. Uh, so that takes us up to about the, the end of the 20th century. Obviously, what you have is a situation where the knowledge that has been produced about autism has kind of gone full circle, where we started off at the start with the idea of it being a form of uh, um, really rich, inventive, creative uh, imagination. We then end up, by the end of the 20th century, with this idea that it's a complete lack of being able to mentally represent or have a, a symbolic concept um, in the mind. And so we see in the very first instance, and this is probably the first sort of piece of the empathy puzzle, is uh, that the, the semantic changes have uh, been quite extraordinary and to the extent that it has become very deficit focused. And you'll see that a lot in the field of autism research, this term that often um, researchers, when they problematize what they want to understand, it starts from the perspective of what's wrong, what needs fixing, what needs changing. Um, so that's one particular challenge that emerged. We then see the development of an alternative perspective uh, as encapsulated by the neurodiversity paradigm, um, which is driven through autistic voice, which wanted to resituate this idea that uh, difference isn't abnormal, but rather uh, all neurotypes within a population would have you know, a natural variation uh, and that uh, maybe the focus shouldn't be on uh, trying to change or fix, but understand, accept, um, and work with uh, to develop ways of uh, facing the challenges that might exist, but also recognizing the strengths that have uh, been largely ignored from having a different uh, neurotype. So uh, at this particular perspective then has resulted in a more autistic voice, which had been up until that point, uh, variously excluded from the actual shaping of the uh, the concept of autism and the identity of autism. Uh, and we get other um, theories such as the double empathy theory, which again, I think Lizzie can expand on more as well, which uh, we've worked together on. Yes, we'll talk about that, absolutely. Yeah. So, that, that, and, and then the last sort of component, because I don't want to go on and on about the uh, uh, history, is, is the kind of way in which and the philosopher Ian Hacking talks about looping effects. 
which is where he describes when a something that we socially construct ends up going into popular culture and it ends up looping back to affect the way that um, we understand that construction. So in the case of autism, the ideas about autism that are shaped variously from uh, science, but also from the media, from films like Rain Man, which continue to dominate kind of stereotypical understanding of autism, uh, these circulate in popular culture and then they come back to affect the way that autistic people see themselves. And so Ian Hacking called this a looping effect. Uh, and we see that this creates another barrier to empathy. It's the fact that there are all these uh, stereotypes um, that autistic people have to navigate. Um, and then the last thing, sorry, there was one more thing, was we had uh, some more even uh, stigmatizing theories as well, uh, such as um, the idea that autism's uh, a form of an extreme male brain, yes. which um, yeah, obviously has extremely negative consequences for women and girls on the spectrum. Uh, we had a uh, kind of false science of the MMR vaccine, the idea that having a measles, mumps and rubella vaccine all in one go would lead to autism. And that was um, false research that was retracted from the Lancet. Uh, we've had uh, the idea that autism is uh, somehow associated with less empathy, but better skills at systemizing. Yes. Uh, again, another problematic uh, idea. Um, all of these theories um, are problematic, particularly when you think that uh, we're talking about an extremely heterogeneous uh, group of people. Um, and so that this, this is why, you know, when you get these big theories sort of hitting um, both the science community, but also circulating in popular culture, that it, it creates further barriers to empathy uh, for autistic people. So that's a, a really brief uh, historical context of uh, some of the challenges around the semantic movements uh, and the kind of consequences for culture uh, for autistic people. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've, I've set things up a bit for you, Lizzie. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, um, thank you, Brett. It was a fantastic um, recount of this history. Lizzie, I wonder if we can remain on the level of theory for a bit more, because we are going to talk about experimental models and, and the empirical uh, uh, perspective. But I wanted to, to ask you, if, Lizzie, if you could tell us a little bit more about these schemes. I think, uh, Brett, you, you were referring to uh, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who is a very prominent uh, psychologist, cognitive psychologist today in the field of autism research, and he has the theory of the empathizing, systemizing scheme and the extreme male brain theory. So, Lizzie, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about this empathizing, systemizing scheme, and then go on to tell us uh, on the level of theory, uh, and particularly, uh, Brett mentioned the double empathy uh, problem, etc. So, how does theory today, how, how do, do, do theories and hypotheses today handle these problematics that arose in the history of, of autistic uh, research. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess a good starting point is just to kind of follow up on the fact that um, um, early, like there was, there was conversation earlier on in some of the earlier talks about this kind of distinction between cognitive and affective or emotional empathy. And um, Within psychology, um, cognitive empathy has been aligned with various other terms, um, such as um, theory of mind, mind reading, mentalizing. Um, as far as I understand it, um, those all mean broadly the same thing. And the sort of oldest uh, cognitive theory in relation to autism is this idea that um, autistic people have um, a deficit or impairment in um, theory of mind, mind reading, uh, cognitive empathy, or whatever, you, whatever you like to call it. Much less has been said about um, the kind of emotional side of empathy in autism, but I think one of the slight um, issues with this field is that uh, quite often there's been this kind of conflation of these two kinds of empathy, particularly in, in you know, popular opinion. So this suggestion that um, autistic people might have a deficit, deficit in cognitive empathy has actually been carried over for people to assume that they um, actually lack this kind of um, ability to resonate with or um, it share emotions with, with others as well. Um, yes. But certainly a lot where a lot of the research is and probably where the original theory came from, it was the cognitive side of empathy that was um, supposedly um, um, 
uh, deficient in autism. And um, there's no, for those of you who maybe don't know huge amounts about autism, um, some of the kind of classic presenting features of autism include things like differences in um, social, uh, social um, sort of communication, differences in the way uh, they maybe interact with other people, um, and, um, and also, um, you know, sometimes um, uh, differences in kind of nature of friendships and things like that, possibly difficulties um, maintaining relationships um, in some contexts. So all of these kind of social differences in autism um, seem to uh, neatly be explained by this supposed um, uh, dif dif deficit in theory of mind or this difficulty in uh, representing other people's uh, mental state. So that was kind of like the classic theory. Um, as Brett said, it, this then got incorporated into um, what was then um, empathizing, systemizing um, theory. Um, and this is the idea that um, all people within the population have these two capacities. One is a capacity to empathize and the other is capacity to uh, system, systemize, which is essentially being able to detect um, regularities, sort of systematic regularities. So things like having a natural understanding of mechanics or um, the way that um, uh, statistics works or things like this would be uh, forms of systemizing. Um, and the idea was that you could, you know, everybody has this kind of defined capacity in these two things, and that falls along um, a normal distribution. So most people have sort of something close to the average amount of those abilities, and then you have a few people at the ends of the distributions who are more extreme. Um, and the suggestion was that autistic people have a particular profile whereby they tend to be um, very uh, at the lower extreme in terms of the empathizing distribution at the, at the, at the higher extreme in terms of the dis systemizing distribution. Um, and then on, so, so, and the extreme male brain theory is almost a kind of a extension of this because it has been observed that um, within the typical population within the general population, so not necessarily people diagnosed as autistic, um, males tend to score a little bit higher than females on measures of um, systemizing and the reverse is true for empathizing. So females on average tend to score a little bit higher. Um, so there was this suggestion that therefore autistic people having this kind of extreme uh, profile um, are like a sort of extreme version of the way that um, males present themselves in these two capacities. Um, and then further to this, um, they went on to suggest that this might be linked to um, the levels of testosterone that the uh, individual is exposed to um, before birth. So um, this was the fetal testosterone theory um, and that this might link into these kind of um, supposed brain differences in um, which are related, which, which are sex linked. Um, so there's quite a few theories in that kind of area that were, um, as Brett said, came about around the turn of the century um, sort of time. Um, so I think the second part of your question was kind of what are the what are some of some of the newer theories that are um, challenging um, these perspectives, um, and in particular about the uh, double empathy um, theory. Um, and if I'm, yeah, in order to introduce this, I guess, I see this from a very methodological point of view, but you've asked me to hold off on the methodology yet. So I'm well, going to try and uh, purely come from a theoretical perspective. Uh -huh. um, and I guess, even from a theoretical perspective, um, I think it was really interesting earlier this morning, I think um, Roland said something about how it's really important to think of empathy as something that happens within the context of a social interaction. Um, and it's not necessarily something that's done just kind of passively um, as you observe um, somebody you don't know or you've never met. It's something that occurs within the context of a social interaction. And um, I think this is kind of what has really been lacking in the psychological 
uh, perspective on empathy, particularly in relation to autism. Um, and in particular, a lot of the research that's claimed that autistic people have this kind of empathy uh, deficit or inability to empathize um, has um, examined the ability of autistic people to empathize with um, non-autistic others. Um, and in actual fact, um, the, the kind of quality of a social interaction is really going to be um, influenced by not just one person within the interaction, but the sort of way in which the two people within the interaction um, gel together. Um, and so um, brilliant scholar, Damien Milton, who's um, not a psychologist, um, uh, or at least not primarily a psychologist. Um, I think he, he was more of a sociologist. Um, he critiqued this kind of theory of mind deficit idea in autism and suggested that actually, um, if uh, you know, if a social interaction is problematic, then that is, that is the result of the a misalignment of both interaction partners. Um, and in, within psychology, unfortunately. So much focus has been on the role of the autistic person within the interaction and what they can or can't do. And there'd been at the time almost no research examining um, actually the ability of the non-autistic interactional partner to empathize with the um, autistic member of the interaction. Um, and uh, Milton suggested that actually it's this kind of um, mutual uh, um, failures to empathize or understand one another that um, give rise to the difficulties or disability you could say that uh, autistic people experience it's a kind of constructed by the fact that um, they come to social interactions with very different experiences very different perceptions of the world and that actually both partners really struggle to to understand um, each other and um, just but unfortunately for autistic people they're in the minority so um, the majority of society um, being non-autistic um, uh, tends to therefore see that see the autistic people as being the problematic uh, partners as opposed to appreciating the two-way nature of it all. Okay, that excellent. I hope uh, people got that and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions later. Let's, let's delve into the uh, practicalities, okay? So before we get into the innovative uh, experimental experimental schemes that you two uh, are behind today. Uh, you know, when we talked before, we've mentioned the fact that there is a certain inherent difficulty in measuring empathy in empirical researches, um, particularly uh, theory of mind in autism and, well, also the fact or the idea of incorporating empathy and participatory research it raises a lot of questions and problems. So maybe we can start talking about that, about the problems in these uh, experimental schemes. And then uh, it would be lovely if you could start mentioning some of your work. How do you deal with these problems? How do you, what, what inventions do you make in, in this field in order to enable us to do something useful with, with empathy when we study autism? So I think, um, that a lot of the issues that around trying to measure empathy or theory of mind or cognitive empathy or whatever we want to call it um, are um, across the board. So they're not exclusive to trying to measure um, it in relation to autism. They're kind of issues around uh, that, that um, plague the whole field. Um, but uh, some, of the, some of the things I think are very challenging are um, you want to, psychologists what they want to try and do is find a task or a way of um, measuring the amount of some kind of amount of empathy or theory of mind ability that a person has um but and so, so with what we're talking about is sort of accuracy um but this is obviously very challenging um perhaps for me the most fundamental problem is that um when you want if you want to determine how accurately somebody can um, understand the inner states of other people, then um, you need some kind of um, 
uh, criterion against which to measure accuracy. And that becomes very, very, very challenging when you're talking about other people's inner states. Um, because um, how, how do you ever really know what another person's um, inner states are in a particular uh, situation or moment? Um, and this has been referred to by um, Weston Kenny as um, the truth criterion. Mm. And um, how do you go about solving this? Um, interesting, I lay a lot of the tasks that have been developed um, that have attempted or purported to measure um, uh, mind reading ability um, have have not really uh, have not really even considered this this issue. So um, there's been a huge amount of research that's looked at um, people's, including autistic people's, ability to identify emotions or mental states from um, images or videos of facial expressions. Um, and in these studies, typically the facial expressions have been uh, posed by actors. Um, and these uh, tasks have um, sometimes, not always, but often uh, found that autistic people have performed more poorly at um, identifying the or labeling the uh, facial expression as happy or sad or angry or whatever it is. Um, and it's very hard for me to see how these kinds of tasks really tell you anything about an ability, a person's ability to actually uh, empathize or even read the mind of another person. Because if the other person is an actor posing a particular facial expression, we've we've got no idea what their what their inner state is at that point in time. It's probably doesn't match the expression that they're trying to pose anyway. Um, they might not be experiencing any particular emotion very strongly. Um, and so these kind of emotion labeling tasks are um, really, um, really problematic. They're very artificial, they're very contrived. Um, and I'm not sure what performance on those kind of tasks really tells us about at all. Um, another method that has been used, um, there's a task called the empathic accuracy task, which was invented by um, somebody called X, um, and this task, it's, it's promising. It involved um, having a, 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 a videotape recording a conversation between two individuals um, and asking one or both of them to um, subsequently watch back the video and report how they were thinking or feeling at various points in time throughout that interaction. So it's, more na it's a natural interaction um, and then asking um, other people to then um, view those videos and decide uh, or try to try to also identify what they think that person is thinking or feeling. Um, and if they uh, if their sort of identification concurs with what the person who was in the video said, then that would be considered to be accurate performance. Um, but we still have some concerns about this kind of task um, in that it requires retrospective in, in sort of introspection on the part of the person who was video recorded. So they have to um, know or remember how they were thinking or feeling at a particular point in time um, within the video. And um, it's quite plausible that if they don't know or they don't remember, they would potentially watch the video as any other person would and just kind of guess based on their facial expressions what they think they might have been thinking or feeling. So. Um, it's perhaps not very surprising that you can get reasonable correlations between what other people say and what the person themselves says, since everybody's watching the same video. Um, so these are some of the kinds of tasks that have been used um, historically. Um, and um, as, as, as I've said, they kind of seem to, ha to have, so have some, some issues and um, what's really needed are, uh, you know, better ways to try and um, investigate um, uh, mind reading accuracy or cognitive empathy accuracy. And this is what you two are doing. So uh, let's, uh, Brett, maybe you want to take, take it off from here and tell us, give us, tell us a little bit about what, what you, you are doing today in order to to, yeah. Well, exactly to press what what uh, Lizzie has been saying. So, yeah, and I think Lizzie did a really great job 
of highlighting um, that there are a, a number of methodological challenges which are sitting on top of theoretical or conceptual challenges. Um, mm -hmm. One of the ones Lizzie was describing there. So, so to go back to the, the theory question first is, uh, and as psychologists, we're, we're only ever really getting snapshots of either self-report or behavior. And we're trying to construct an understanding of empathy, which is very complex in a life experience. So it's a bit like trying to draw a landscape at nighttime and all you've got is one torch. You're only seeing a small portion of that landscape at any one time. So we have that challenge that uh, our methods are very uh, like a snapshot of what's going on, whereas empathy is more of a temporal phenomenon. It takes time to emerge, to show itself, to, to, to show its qualities, its dynamic. So there's a challenge there already with the fit between uh, the need to create a controlled environment for accurate measurement, as Lizzie was talking about, and the fact that the phenomena of empathy is uh is, is very fluid it's flowing through time uh in um in beautiful and creative ways so uh there's just a very basic challenge there already with the fit between uh the phenomenon and the methods that we're trying to use i think uh, as, as lizzie was talking about one key change is to make it bi-directional so let's not just look at empathy in one direction but let's look at it in both directions and, and incorporating that into the types of tasks we have been using has, has already showed that uh, non-autistic people really struggle to understand uh, uh, autistic uh, behavior and communication so it's we know it's a two-way problem and and there's very good research on that i think from my perspective in in my research one of the things i i found interesting was how uh potentially difficult uh, the questions are that you're asking autistic people to do because often the tasks are very abstract. So if you take, for example, the Sally Ann uh, theory of mind test where you present to a child two different dolls, one of them has a marble uh, and they put it in a, one location and they leave and then whilst they're gone, uh, the other doll moves the marble and the first doll comes back and you ask the child whether they look for the marble. Uh, and it's a test of false belief attribution. Will the child recognize that the, the first doll will have a false belief about the location of a marble? Um, that this is potentially a really abstract thing, to, uh, way of testing empathy because the dolls aren't real. And if you already have an orientation to the world, um, which might be more literal, um, asking to, to imagine the perspectives of inanimate objects is, is quite a curious thing to do. Uh, we take it for granted that children are just naturally creative, but perhaps uh, there are already biases we're bringing into the process of how we uh, create these very abstract scenarios to test the very phenomenon that isn't abstract, it's extremely uh, lived uh, and concrete in everyday life, empathy. So my, my interest was thinking about, well, how can we make things less abstract? How can we move it nearer to everyday contexts that are complex and messy to measure, but have uh, better validity in terms of being able to observe uh, what's going on? Uh, and my background from uh, the communication side of things, uh, I was really interested in intersubjectivity. So how do we bring together subjectivities? How do we create shared understanding? Uh, and it's certainly the case that I've done research with uh, the hundreds of autistic people, and I'm also a, a trustee of a charity that supports hundreds of autistic people. So I've been fortunate enough to see that um, autistic people uh, love to interact. Uh, it might not always be with people according to social conventions, but they love to interact. Um, and sometimes interacting with each other can have fantastic rapport, sometimes interacting on their own with a, a, an object or an interest or a hobby uh, is also a great source of enjoyment. Um, so I became really interested in this idea of intersubjectivity, uh, thinking about can we develop ways to map uh, how autistic people create shared understanding and can we do that in a way which isn't imposing normative values as to what is good or bad communication. Um, 
And so I, I did uh, more ethnographic research. Uh, one of my studies was uh, filming autistic people interacting with each other around uh, a naturally occurring activity, which happened to be video gaming um, at, a, at the charity I was uh, helping out at. Uh, and that was amazing. That was a really eye-opening experience for me because at first I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, contrary to the literature, there was, there was huge amounts of communication. There was, there was shouting, there was laughter. There was, uh, I, I, I really struggled to understand what was being communicated because the amount of um, cultural references that were being shared, it was so rapid I couldn't follow. Uh, I was very much an outsider, uh, but it was clear that there was rapport within the room from uh, the fact that people wanted to stay and they were enjoying and they were laughing. Uh, and also it was clear that it was productive because in terms of progress in the games they were playing, they were very good at them. So uh, it was interesting to basically be in an environment where no one was uh, in, imposing normative ideas about how long to speak, uh, at what volume to speak, uh, how to negotiate turn-taking, how to reciprocate understanding. These uh, very basic sort of conventions that we're all socialized into were kind of thrown out the window. And in its place, it appeared to be chaos. But actually, uh, when I used the process of conversation analysis to systematically look at the structure of these uh, very dynamic interactions, I started to realize that there are patterns of reciprocation. It's just that they take place over a much longer time scale. Uh, it's not about responding in the moment to what's just been said. So someone could ignore someone else, which would be a loss of face for uh, the rest of us who cling on to social convention tightly. But in this context, it didn't matter uh, if someone was ignored, but they might uh, pick up on it later on, something that someone else said. Um, and so what you had was this sort of very free environment where there was this shared understanding building up of all this communication all this externalization of individual thought which actually provided a fantastic resource for uh, developing um, moments of rapport moments of discovered connections that they didn't realize they shared something in common or an interest or even what i got very excited about was developing new ways of uh, indexing the problems they were facing so for example there was one game they were playing where a, a new enemy appeared which was this kind of laser shining down at them and they didn't know how to deal with it but uh, one of them talked about the film tron which uh, was a way of sort of signifying that the threat was coming and then they used this new language uh, and, and these kind of cultural references to orientate to the problem uh, as the uh, uh, activity un undertook and it meant that they could address the problem so uh, basically to to sort of summarize um it's an incredibly rich dynamic environment and it opened up the question of well if we were to relax um uh, social conventions um it, and you need both parties to do it this is where the double empathy problem is really important because you need both parties to uh, share the feeling that you need you can relax conventions you end up with what appears to be more disorganized interactions, but actually just a different pattern of intersubjectivity, uh, a, a completely new style that's actually very suited to creativity and exploration uh, and is uh, a lot less focused on sort of minute sort of social navigation through a, a task. It's just a different way of being in the world. Um, so, yeah, that's a sort of illustration and summary of uh, kind of how I translated from uh, the theory to the method to the empirical evidence uh, so yeah fantastic brett is that has that been published already yeah absolutely yeah it's in the journal autism uh, and that's the paper that so that i called it neurodivergent intersubjectivity which is a lot of syllables um but it it, it very neatly encapsulates what i was trying to describe fantastic okay uh, lizzie you care to to add a little bit uh, from your experience Sure, yeah, so I think we, we've, um, myself and other colleagues at the University of Nottingham have develop, developed um, a task that's perhaps a little bit more um, experimental and controlled than what Brett has just described, but um, still I think follows in the same pattern of, of trying to get closer to more kind of naturalistic um, observations of 
um, social behavior and kind of these theory of mind abilities. And the task that we've we've developed is called we call it the retrodictive mind reading task. So another long term, um, but retrodictive refers to this idea that um, when when you read another person's mind or attempt to identify their mental states, most of the time you're not doing it as that. That's not the kind of ultimate goal. Is not just to understand whether that person is happy or sad or whatever whatever it might be. It's actually to um, uh, relate that to some kind of um, behavioral consequence whether it be either being able to predict what somebody might do in the future such as within the Sally Ann task uh, but also often to, often it will be in order to um, make some kind of backward um, prediction or attribution if you like about what might have given rise to that particular behavior so most of the time we don't really want to just know what somebody's thinking or feeling but we want to kind of know what's just happened to that person why are they doing that what's going on um, and the retrodictive mind reading task sort of makes use of that fact that any kind of um, emotional reaction is going to be embedded in a particular context. Um, so what we do in this task is we have um, two phases. Um, in the first phase, we get participants into the lab. Uh, we have some kind of cover story about a piece of research that they're going to take part in. Um, and the cover story um, um, involves that they're going to at some point be video recorded within the session. Um, but actually what happens is we have the video camera on from the moment they arrive and uh, they, we record their behavior as they react to um, certain scripted events that um, the researcher uh, basically acts out. Um, so these are things that they will do incidentally uh, whilst briefing the participant. Um, so we've done things like, for example, um, tell the participant a joke, which the researcher said they'd heard on the radio that morning, um, or tell the participant about how the researchers had a really bad day and lots of things went wrong. Um, or we did one where there was, uh, I like the example this morning about the compliments, because we've actually done a, a scenario where the researcher compliments the participant on something they're wearing. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, the, the details of the specifics of these is not really important. The idea is really just to try and do something that is plausible within the context of an experiment so it's not going to give the game away but will likely provoke some kind of reaction from the participant so we record videos in this way and then in the second phase of the research we present a whole bunch of videos that we recorded um, and ask other people who don't know them to guess what that person is reacting to um, out of the various options. Um, and we like this, we think this is quite a good task for measuring this kind of ability to work out what other people are thinking or feeling because um, it's to some extent gets around this issue of the truth criterion in that we don't ask the participants to guess the, the, the person's mental state within the video. We don't know what it is. Um, maybe nobody knows what it is. Um, but we do ask them to guess the scenario, which is something we definitely know. It's something we've recorded. So we can get a kind of true measure of accuracy of sorts. We're also dealing with people's natural and guarded reactions. They don't know they're being video recorded. So although obviously it's a slightly um, unnatural situation being in a, in a psychology lab, um, at the very least, we know that it's um, their kind of real behavior within that context. And the, also the other really interesting thing about this task is that you do get quite a variety of reactions. So not all people react, will react to the same event in the same way. Some people may genuinely find the joke funny. Other people may, may not. They might laugh politely. They might be embarrassed by it. There's a whole range of different reactions. And one of the things that we have to try and do when we're empathizing with other people is make these, some kind of adjustment for the fact that different people might react in different ways. It's not the case that um, everybody will always behave exactly as you would in that situation. And somehow we do, we do some, a lot of the time successfully manage to get around that. The other really nice thing about this task in relation to autism is that um, it actually um, enables us to guess. We can use it as a measure of how readable or how easy it is for um, individuals to be read by others, um, which, which isn't so easy to do when you've got people posing um, men emotions or mental states. Um, so what we found is that when we recorded videos in this way, 
of um, autistic people and non-autistic people um, and present them to non-autistic observers, uh, we find that non-autistic people are quite good at guessing um, what's the people reacting to when they're observing non-autistic people, but have a lot more difficulty when the people in the videos are autistic. Um, so we take this as evidence that um, is in line with this kind of double empathy approach, which is actually that non-autistic people um, misunderstand, misperceive, find it difficult to work out what autistic people may be uh, thinking or feeling um, in these um, scenarios. And this may then um, contribute hugely to um, the challenges that autistic people face, because if they're being misperceived and misunderstood uh, by other people, then um, this could have lots of then lots of um, social consequences. It might mean that they um, are, um, uh, you know, like found less socially favourable, which is um, something that has also been very sadly uh, found um, in relation to autistic people that non-autistic people often tend to judge them um, less uh, positively in terms of various kind of social desirability traits. Um, it could also lead to things like social exclusion um, or, you know, bullying, things like this. Um, and it might also contribute to the fact that um, autistic people uh, are known to have, um, especially um, as they get older, known to have quite high levels of uh, mental health challenges. Um, so we think like that some of the consequences of this being misperceived could really be um, uh, very significant um, in terms of quality of life for autistic people. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's uh, my favorite, uh, always my favorite part of reading your, your papers is the discussion section. Um, uh, I love, I love uh, what, what, the, what conceptual developments you make out of these experiment experimental models I, le I leave it to you guys to to do the work in the in the laboratory right uh, but uh, and you know there's this huge discussion between physicists who, who's more important the experimental or the theoretical one right no one knows though so. but going back to theory then just um, just because I, I have the opportunity to to exploit you a little bit today so uh, what would you say are the theoretical developments that you have made based on these experimental models that are groundbreaking and have changed the face of of the, the world of autism research so what what conclusion did you reach? Uh, first of all, maybe about autism, so that's interesting for us. Mm -hmm. But maybe for 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 the sake of of our discussion today, what did we learn uh, about empathy in general uh, from these innovative uh, research methods of empathy in autism? So, what did we learn about empathy from autistic people then? Brett, I think it's. Uh, I think I'll I'll ask you to to begin maybe. Uh, yeah, I can go first. I mean, first of all, I think you've been very generous in saying we've changed the world. I'm not sure if uh, <laughs> we've quite got there yet. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of work to do. And, well, um... I'll tell you something. I've, I've told that to Lizzie. When you read the progression of your work, you go over it. It's even if it's only the discourse on autism and empathy that has changed so dramatically in your own work. And you see that it's a substantial change. And I think it has an effect on the world of science in general. Right. As as we have in, in our discussion, you were mentioning moving from from a theory, from uh, perceiving autism, a cure for autism, to a caring for autism. This is something that you, you've mentioned. So mm -hmm. I don't think you should be too humble here. <laughs> it's important well, for autistic people. Right? Yeah, it's it's an interesting point actually because Lizzie, myself, and Damien, uh, we wrote uh, an, an encyclopedia entry for double empathy in 2018, uh, and by 2020 we were rewriting it because oh. so much research had been done yes. and again it's already out of date so it, it really is a, a, it's fantastic to see that uh, there is now such a, a huge growth of research in this area um, so, so, so like you're saying but but I think you know I, I see myself as just part of it uh, of, of a bigger process but the mo most important thing is that the process is happening and it is shifting I think as you said the, the fundamental thinking and, and, and approaches to, to autism uh, which in the long run, I hope, will result in more empathic uh, research. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, what was your original question? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
basically I was saying, well, what did we learn about autism right, from yeah. these new experimental methods? And what did we learn about empathy from autistic people? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's a really nice question to ask. And, and um, there, was a, there was a paper in uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences a couple of years ago, which was uh, uh, talking about um, uh, the idea that we need to rethink our approach to uh, autism to make it more bi bi-directional. Uh, and but it was a it was a paper where there was the opportunity for commentaries and everyone involved in double empathy research <laughs> got involved in in writing commentaries which they then responded to and said that it had really helped them with their um understanding uh, what the commentary i wrote for that was talking about how um and and i i haven't written about this much but i'd like to do more of it is saying that i think the human race as a whole is missing out by uh not understanding the strengths uh, of autism and in particular I believe that there are social strengths uh, and I think the fact that we have a very pathologized and stigmatized view of autism a normative idea of what is and counts as social convention means we're missing out on uh, some quite fantastic things uh, so for example being I don't know in a in a uh, board meeting and someone uh, is not uh, bullshitting <laughs> they're just saying it as there is that type of uh, communication style ha ha has a really uh, great place in some environments likewise uh, as I said in my research uh, even though being uh, more anthropological in a way and ethnographic means it's less controlled I think what you see is that the minute you do uh, relax some of the constraints that as psychologists, we often put participants into situations that are um, uh, controlled because we, we need that control. But when you relax those constraints, you see creative things happen that you never you never uh, realized was your research question in the first place. And so, um, uh, and I think that's the exciting thing about uh, different neurotypes is it, it, they just take you somewhere that you weren't there before. Um, and in a way, there's a there's a, not to get too philosophical, but the argument that both deductive and inductive reasoning all you ever do is take a pre premise and kind of force it to, to some kind of conclusion whether it's you know forced completely through logic or if it's there's some inductive leap uh, and there's another sort of strand of reasoning which is abductive reasoning uh, which is that uh, how do we even generate ideas for what to research in the first place and it comes from uh, being surprised uh, mm. Uh, why is it surprising? Well, it's, when you encounter something that's surprising, it's because it stands up against your background assumptions. And I find that's the case all the time with autism is I, I, I start doing one study and then I, I observe something I just didn't, um, I didn't even think of in the first place. And that's led me, you know, that paper I was talking about with neurodivergent intersubjectivity, it happened because uh, I couldn't get participants to take part in my theory of mind task. They wanted to play video games, not uh, take part in experiments. So I ended up studying them playing video games. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the more I'm in that sort of environment, the more I, I you know, I think it's the creativity and innovation um, that's really exciting about autism. And also just that the empathy is there. You just need to, um, change your uh, frame of reference for recognizing it um so 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 basically that to bring that to a conclusion i i think that autism is telling me more about what it means to be human because i think we have a really uh sanitized and normalized view of what it means to be human what it means to be social and actually um that's because we're suppressing uh the recognition of what um autism could bring and that is showing me what the diversity of being human is mm. absolutely so thanks for that uh brett uh, lizzie maybe you want to put in a few last words about uh, our lessons about empathy then uh, and then we'll we'll open up for questions i'm sure there are many questions i have many questions so you're not done yet but let's see let, let's have a few last words I think Brett summed it up really well, so I'm going to be quite brief. I think firstly, I just sort of wanted to say that I think that this kind of double empathy theory approach, which is not obviously our contribution as such, but one that we've started gathering data in support of, um, yes. it has great big implications for society and, and the idea that society needs to um, adapt and, um, you know, become more aware of autism and, um, 
you know, try, try as wherever possible to learn to empathise more. And I have actually come around to thinking that autistic people spend a huge amount of time trying to empathise with non-autistic people. And actually, um, non-autistic people um, may do, m spend much less time trying to empathise with autistic people and, and adjustments, you know, clearly need to be made in, in, in that area. But secondly, um, in terms of empathy more broadly, I think um, the double empathy problem theory was written to apply to more cases than just autism. So autistic and non-autistic people are a really good example that illustrates this um, problem with um, empathy where you have people coming from very different mindsets or very different world experiences. But we can probably think of lots of other cases where you have um, in groups and out groups who perhaps see the world quite differently and may actually then struggle to empathize with each other um, in, the, in the kind of ways that we would measure, to try and measure in the lab, maybe or maybe not successfully. So perhaps people from different cultures or with different religious backgrounds and, and things like that. And perhaps that's, you know, perhaps that's self-evident and obvious that people from these different kinds of groups don't empathize well with each other. But um, sort of explicit awareness of that um, is, um, is uh, hopefully goes some way towards improving that because people may not may not really be aware that um, they are going to struggle to empathize with people who maybe come from very different background or very different worldviews and you kind of have to set aside all your assumptions about the appropriate ways to express certain emotions or the you know behavioral rules or things like that um, when you're when you're um, interacting with people from a whole host of different um, different backgrounds from yourself so I think there's kind of um, lots of testable hypotheses for us psychologists and kind of some take homes for for people in other fields as well um, from this particular theory. Fantastic. Uh, I think uh, we'll uh, stop with the lecture here. And thank you very much. We'll open up for questions. I'm going to grab the first question if it's fine, because it's, it's really continuing what Lizzie was just saying. And I don't know if you've ever uh, participated in a discussion in Germany. They're usually shyer here. It takes them time. So I'll ask the first question and then they can, they can begin. So, um, you know, you talked about hacking, Ian Hacking, a very interesting philosopher that writes about autism. And in his, I, I just recently did this talk about autobiographies, about autistic autobiographies. And I read his paper from 2009 about autobiographies. And he says some, something interesting. I wanted to ask you too, if you have any comment on it. He says that, well, he goes with the double empathy problem idea and says that this short circus, circuit, <laughs> the, yeah, this short circuit in empathizing is bi-directional. It's not that autistic people cannot empathize only, but it is bi-directional. So both directions have problems. But he says something interesting, and it's interesting for us here because uh, a lot of us here do uh, research in cultural and social psychology. So we also ask ourselves a question about culture, the cultural and social effect on, on psychology of the subject. And he says that, well, there is this Sort short circuit in empathy between people from different cultures. So he says, yeah, uh, I see someone from, uh, I don't know, from a different culture that is distinct from mine, and we might have a short circuit, we might have some problems empathizing with one another, and they might be substantial. But then he says that between autistic and non-autistic people, the short circuit is qualitatively distinct. He says it is it is different than that one. We cannot reduce it to the to the question of cultural difference. And I wanted to ask you to what do you think about this from your experience, from your theorization? You explain a little bit, Leon, in which way it's different. Well, uh, he said what what he says basically is that um, uh, while uh, there is a short circuit, empathic short circuit between people of different cultures. Mm -hmm there are still ways to empathize even without the shared cultural uh, information or knowledge. He says there is still, he calls it the cohort, because cohort talked a lot about it, but I, I don't remember exactly how he calls it, but there's a certain quality that enables these people to eventually mm -hmm. find a common ground on that empathic level. Mm -hmm. While he says that with autistic and non-autistic people, this is not the case. So it's a very interesting argument. And I wonder what, what did you think about it? 
yeah, I have thoughts, but Lizzie, did, did you want to go first? Um, I, can, I guess I can do. I mean, from I've not read this paper, so I think I'm coming from um, a very naive position here. Um, yeah. And I think I would need really need to know more about what on what basis he's making this this claim. Um, if it's the case that, I mean, clearly, different every di where you've got differences between groups that have different kinds of um, backgrounds, there will be some common ground and some um, distinctive um, experiences, and the differences arguably and again this might not totally be the case arguably some of the differences between um people from different cultures are pr primarily due to environmental differences whereas you could say that differences between autistic and non-autistic people some of them will be um at the level of kind of um more like bodily experiences like sensory differences for example um so <laughs> I can I can completely appreciate it might not be the same, but I'd like to think that it's not so dire as that 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 the differences can never um, be reduced or there can never be some form of connection between autistic and non autistic people. So um, I'd like to think that actually there there would be um, ways that um, changes can be made, probably primarily on part of the non autistic groups, since I think autistic people are already doing a lot of a um, lot to try and move towards the non-autistic perspective. Um, but, but that's just kind of my, my, the thoughts off the top of my head. Um, and I'd have to really understand more about, about the argument to say whether or not I, I'm on board with it. Yes, but absolutely. I, I was simplifying the argument. <laughs> might be able to say more. <laughs> yes, but I think that hacking doesn't say there is no way to, to, to make, to, to bridge that gap, but he says that this empathy that empathy would in this sense in the sense that we discussed it today would not be uh this particular way but yeah i'll send you the the paper later but brett what about you what do you say yeah i i wrote about this in my my doctoral thesis uh so i need to go back and remember what my arguments were then but um i i kind of agree uh i guess if, if i'm to like fall on, on on one side of things that there are certain things that are qualitatively difficult uh, different and I think Damien Milton said the same thing is that he, he doesn't want double empathy to be too watered down in terms of uh, being compared to, to other just cross-cultural context because mm. uh, as, as Lizzie mentioned there's there's a there's a cognitive uh, uh, there's ideas about cognition which you wouldn't really get um, in in a cross-cultural context which, which could be challenging so the, the fact that um, I found in my research sometimes one of the barriers to understanding or empathizing with autistic people was uh, a representation that they couldn't do it themselves so there was basically very low expectation uh, being set of them by um, uh, others uh, which didn't actually um, compare with the reality of what I was finding uh, so you get these kind of um, uh, uh, representations which are are pressing in from ideas about limited uh, cognitive abilities but also sensory differences um, and i think one of the challenges there is with with a cross-cultural context there are certain things we can turn to like food uh, music um, there are practices which are designed to bring people uh, together and which all cultures have um, but in the sense of trying to understand how someone sees the world differently, hears the world differently, feels the world differently, we don't have a template for knowing what that's like because we've only ever experienced the world in one way. And so we, I've found uh, in my research that it's very, very hard for people to understand that if they see someone autistic who's becoming overwhelmed, that it could be the result of an accumulation of different uh, uh, sensory uh, stresses because they can't understand why a particular sound or a particular temperature might be, uh, or a particular pattern on a shirt that someone's wearing, why that could be so uh, potentially disabling. So I think there's just an imagination barrier there in understanding what it's like to be autistic from a sensory point of view. And there's also these, these stigmatizing representation. On that, I have a video um, of walking through town with Campbell, who I uh, used to be a carer for and Campbell has learning difficulties as well as being autistic but it's like a 
uh, a hazard perception video where it sort of identifies all the stresses in his environment that lead to him uh, feeling uh, overwhelmed. Uh, and that's been used as a really good tool for uh, showing people that there's more going on than they realize um, uh, and that they need to sort of expand their frame of reference for that uh, sensory challenge. So yeah, I, I, I do think there are, there are particular things that are qualitatively different uh, in that relationship, but at the same time, uh, definitely agree with what Lizzie was saying that you know you can have uh, you can bridge that gap but it, it requires you to relax your expectations and norms in the first place yes well then I'll have to read your your doctoral thesis <laughs> I'll just I'll give you the page number save you the time <laughs> <laughs> okay I know what you mean here uh so how are on there someone Yes, we have someone on the Zoom, but uh, you are here with your body, so you get a preference uh, if anyone has a question. Or we'll get to the vinyl dinosaur. Well, I, I just have a, a short question just for information. Mm -hmm. And that is, have any tests or experiments been done where it is being investigated how autistic persons understand each other? as compared to them being understood by non-autistic persons. I think sorry, Lizzie, a few sorry, of these. Well, just to give the background of my question is, if you make the comparison to cross-cultural problems, for example, in in the field of intercultural communications, where they often deal with um, the encounter of people from different so-called cultures, then normally we could say, well, sooner or later it will work, it has to do with adaption, socialization in the new culture and so on. But can the non-autistic person really be expected to adapt or socialize into an autistic culture? And are there tests that help us to understand to solve that question? Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. So one of the one of the questions about double double empathy problem theory or, or whatever it, we're going to call it um, is whether it actually entails that people of the same neurotype would actually um, understand each other better or have an advantage. So do um, autistic people understand other autistic people better than um, non-autistic people do. And, um, and I think as far as far as I as far as I know, and, and Brett might have other ideas about this, I don't think it's an essential claim of the theory that there will be greater understanding between um, people of the same neurotype. So I think I, I, my understanding of the theory is that it's primarily refers to there being difficulty in empathy between people who are radically different as opposed to um, good empathy between people who are maybe more similar on those dimensions. Um, in terms of research, um, in relation to kind of recognizing facial expressions or mental states, um, so far, most of the evidence seems to suggest that autistic people are not better at identifying facial expressions of other autistic individuals. And it may be that actually their expressions are therefore um, a bit more, um, a bit more um, individualized or idiosyncratic. There's not necessarily sort of differences in facial expressions that are universal um, across autistic people. Um, but there's, there's lots of other lovely research that um, has been done that, including I think Brett's own work that he talked about, that suggests that there are certain ways in which um, autistic people do resonate more with each other. So they may actually show better rapport when um, engaged in, um, in uh, various types of interactions, um, not both as self-rated, but also as rated by observers. Um, so that's research done by Catherine Crompton and various other people. Um, and um, so, so there is there, there, there's some there is some evidence out there that seems to suggest that there are certain um, um, nice things about the way that autistic people interact with each other. Um, but um, it's not necessarily the case that they have this kind of one specific 
mode of, of interaction or communication that we just need to unlock and be able to understand that would then enable um, better, better social interaction or better social understanding on the side of non-autistic people. Um, so it might be more about, as Brett has talked about, sort of being open to the, to the fact that um, th there might be um, um, responses might not be as normative as normative as uh, what we might expect from other non-autistic people and being okay okay with that um, as opposed to you know having a very clear expectation about what a social interaction with an autistic person will be like because it might actually really depend depend a lot more on the individual okay so um another question in if you want to speak if you want to Oh, sorry, Brett. Did you have uh, did you have something to add? I'm sorry, I didn't uh, notice. No, I, I think at least you did a really great job there. And um, so yeah, I think uh, it, Catherine Compton's done a really great study of looking at information transfer and mixing yes. dyads of autistic and non-autistic. And uh, her study found that the autistic only dyads and the non-autistic only dyads had better information transfer than when you mix it. So it was good empirical evidence for the double entity problem. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, uh, implicit understanding of social cues remains a challenge for autistic people. Um, the evidence suggests whether it's autistic or non-autistic target. But I think it's, yeah, it, the, there was an interesting extra question there, which is can non-autistic people be socialized into those environments? Um, speaking from my own experience, I'd say yes. Um, and we often see that in contexts of caregiving in particular, that a, a new type of dynamic and understanding develops, oh, but it takes time. And I think this comes back to my temporal thing about empathy. It takes time to recognize each other, to understand each other in different contexts for, uh, for it to really work. So, and, and as Lizzie was saying, you've got to, it, it is really hard to unlearn the way you've been socialized into the world. It's really hard to do that. So it, again, it takes time. I very much agree. By the way, Brett has a video on YouTube that goes over many uh, experiment the, that going on today in, on the double empathy problem. So you can search double empathy problem. Uh, that's the name of the video, double empathy? Yeah, it was like a podcast I did. Yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. But Emma. you did it nicely with these characters. I like that. It was very... <laughs> Had more time like, on my hands back then. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, we have two more questions here, but we have five minutes, uh, so three more questions. So I'll just do it in the order that I saw you guys, okay? Uh, so there in the back, and yeah? Yeah, I'm sorry if it's not a very fitting question, uh, but I read this book by Lisa Feldman Barrett, where she is called How Emotions Are Made, and she explains her theory of constructed emotions. And it really reminded me of what you were saying uh, in general, the necessity to contextualize and specifically, for example, the, uh, the critique of this, um, these experiments where actors pose these emotions that they thought by Darwin, how they apparently are natural. Uh, so I was thinking if there's a link between these two theories, either in premises or also in methods. I didn't, I didn't quite hear the, the theory. Uh... It's been used in Feltman Barrett for the theory of constructive emotions. So I'm just a psychologist, that's what I thought we would. Fantastic, yeah. I'll, I'll look forward to looking that up, but uh, that's nice to hear that it, it chimes with what you've been reading about um, elsewhere. So that's, that's exciting to hear, thank you. Okay, that's good. Maybe we can meet again and talk about it. Uh, so we have, uh, Quinn? Yeah, just very quickly, and maybe this is for Lizzie. Um, early on, you were talking about the, uh, development of a so-called extreme male brain. brain. And I'm wondering if uh, what the etiology of that is, is this a, a methodological problem where uh, a mistake is made? Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to be too generous to idiocy, but if a mistake is made in terms of distribution of male versus female versus uh, systemic versus affective, if that was the distinction, uh, or if there's a, a more widespread um, uh, I guess I would, in my discipline, I would say ideological misreading or misrecognition, a patriarchal one, and so on. So I was wondering what the, what uh, I know we don't have much time, but if what your thoughts were in, in terms of that question. I think it's both, <laughs> but I'll let Lizzie answer. Um, 
so I think if I, well, I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that um, the, so the tools that we use to, to create this theory are primar have primarily be, been questionnaire tools. Um, so um, they're not, <laughs> They're not necessarily the most, um, you know, valid or sensitive to, um, you know, they, they could easily be constructed um, to create gender differences based on kind of a priori assumptions about what, what genders do. Um, but I think in terms of the, even if there are gen gender differences, very slight gender differences in these you know, if, if we really could measure empathizing and systemizing very accurately, and if there really is one capacity that a person has a finite amount of in these two different areas, which I think are obviously very uh, contentious assumptions, just because males tend to have a little bit more of systemizing and females tend to have a little bit more of empathizing, there's a very big logical gap between that and saying that autistic people therefore have um, a brain that's extremely male in nature. So I think is that uh, does that does that kind of address the question? Oh, you're saying it's a priori. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Um, basically, there's so much research going to debunk these theories. Uh, particularly uh, in my home university, uh, where I did my dissertation, the psychology department, there's a professor that spends a lot of time debunking such sort of gender distinction narratives, and also the extreme male brain theory. So they sort of demonstrate the biases that can bring that into it is puzzling why this theory is so prevalent why is so popular i find it very puzzling but um, yeah that's how science goes i think an, another challenge as well is all the early studies of autism were just on boys so the diagnostic criteria yes. is biased uh, and there's been a massive push in, in the last couple of decades to understand what autism actually looks like for women and girls on the spectrum so our understanding is just really uh, patchy about um, the relationship between sex and autism. Uh, so, so that's part of it. And then, yeah, I think that the theory has problems in the sense that there's also an argument from the same researcher about um, people who are good at systemizing are good at science. So, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, it gets, uh, yeah, really problematic, these ideas. That's an understatement. Maybe we can stop here. Okay, we'll stop here uh, with uh, Brett and Lizzie. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting inv inviting us. It's been really, really great um, chatting about this stuff and we could probably go on for hours longer. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. I already have some ideas, but we'll talk about that later. Thanks for dropping in. I hope you have a nice afternoon in the, in the UK. It's, it's extremely warm here. I hope it's, uh, it's sunny and nice uh, with you as well. And you're welcome to stay. We're gonna have uh, Phil joining us now. Um, we're going to take a five minute break so you can relax and Phil will put you on right now and Phil will keep on talking about empathy in a clinical setting and, and experimental setting so it might be interesting to you too as well. So thank you again and uh, see you in five minutes everybody. Yep thanks very much thank you. <laughs>